Good morning. We're at five stores now, so I hope to be on Nick's slide next time he presents next year. He's growing up there at the, at the companies there. Um, as you said, my name's Heather. I'm with Clatch Coffee. We're based here in uh, Inland Empire. Um, we've got five retail locations and a roastery, and we've been in business for 25 years. Um, and it's my pleasure today to talk to you a little bit about trends in U.S. coffee shops, where they're going, what we're seeing happening, and a lot of them we've honestly discussed this morning. I mean, nothing here is totally groundbreaking. A lot of them are what we're already seeing and what we're talking about. Um, and when you talk about what's happening, in, I think the reason when you come to places like this, you talk about trends is because you want to know what are other people doing? What am I missing out on? What are you doing that I'm not doing? And so that's the reason that these are always so important. And when we look at what the trends are in coffee, I think two words can really come to mind for everybody. When you talk about coffee houses, particularly here in the US, cold brew. I mean, cold brew is still considered a trend. One of the things when I was kind of doing this and laying out is when we talk about trends and what we're thinking of, I mean, cold brew feels like something that we've been talking about for a decade now. But here it is really still considered a trend. Um, this was the first year that it actually stagnated in day, uh, past day drinkers. Cold brew did not grow this year, but still considered a trend. The next one that you're going to see is nitro. Now, how many of you guys know what nitro is? All right, notice not the entire room, which really surprised me. So we actually just were doing a presentation in our lab a few weeks ago with a group of salespeople from a, a brewing manufacturing company. And we got to the point where we were talking about nit uh, nitro, nitro cold brew. And it was kind of a quick conversation. And some of the salespeople had some questions. And what we realized, they were salespeople from all over the US. A lot of them had never seen nitro before. It is not part of their market. So while here in Southern California, nitro is an enormous part of the brand and the marketing here that you're going to see, there are parts of the world or parts of the US that nitro has still not even touched. Last year, past day drinkers for nitro went up 4%, and I think we're going to continue to see that grow and trend. And it's not just with nitro, but with sparkling as well. Sparkling sodas, sparkling coffee sodas are something you're going to see continue to emerge as well. Not just in the cafe environment, but also in the RTD environment. You're going to continue to see that segment grow both in coffee houses, in the grab and go merchandise. You know, it's kind of like, do I want to get my cold brew from the grab and go or do I want to get it from the barista? Depends on my mood and what kind of rush I'm in. Do I want to drink it now? Do I want to drink it later? Um, and that's something that I think you're going to see coffee houses who are bottling start to kind of struggle with as they figure that out. They kind of become their own competition in some of these areas. And I think they're going to start working through that. Um, some of the other trends that we're talking about and that we're seeing in coffee is micro roasting. We talked about kind of specialty coffee has always been a fairly fragmented industry, as you saw by kind of just those, all of the names that you've seen come up there. And we're really seeing that continue to expand. So five years ago, the SCA did a survey with Roast Magazine and PBI, and they estimated the number of coffee roasters in the US to be about 5,000 coffee roasters. Today, just five years later, they put that number at almost 8,000 coffee roasters, really fragmenting that coffee market. And one of the great lines that I've heard from a roaster is when you're a coffee roaster, all of your clients are, potential, are either future competitors or future bad debt, but they don't stay as customers. So wholesale coffee roasting is definitely one of the hardest jobs out there, which is why you're seeing more roasters switch to adding cafes, becoming their own customer, their biggest customer. Um, and that's why you're also seeing a lot of cafes now adding on roasting, becoming that competitor of what was their previous roaster. Um, the other thing that you're obviously seeing quite a bit of, and we've already talked about it this morning, is obviously consolidation. We're seeing tons of consolidation. Oops, I went backwards. My apologies. Tons of consolidation. So we already talked about this this morning. Between Jab, Nestle, Starbucks, and Dunkin', 80% of the market, leaving 20% for the rest of the specialty coffee market out there. Now, what's interesting is that small, that 20% wall small is fairly mighty, and it really sets the tone and the trends for where you're going to see other things going. I have always thought that Starbucks Reserve was kind of a compliment to us in specialty coffee. I'm saying, wow, that's really cool. How do we do that? And the Reserve Store, I thought, was always kind of a nod to things that were being done really well in the coffee industry. And you're seeing that continue to expand as well. But what are going to be the next trends that these 20% continue to do and continue to build on? Well, for me, I don't think it's going to be cold brew or nitro that really kind of separates it and builds your customer base. I actually don't even think it's better tasting coffee. And this coming from a company that just paid $803 a pound for some of the elite geisha best of Panama. I don't really think that that's going to be the difference maker in why customers come to you. 
So I kind of see three main areas of growth for a lot of these craft cafes in the US and where they're going to go with it. Um, and the first one is food. Now, food isn't something we've talked about this morning, but it's definitely changing the landscape of the coffee house environment. We're not talking about pastries and muffins and desserts anymore, but really following a lot of the Australian model, like with Bluestone Lane, Proud Mary's another example that is coming in and they're doing. Um, and these food, the, the idea behind food is it adds an additional revenue stream. You know, we've talked about labor and you talked about coffee, how cheap a cup of coffee is and how hard it is to make these margins. I'm constantly shocked people want to get into the coffee business and like, it's a gold mine, it's like 25 cents a cup and you just keep all that money. That is not the reality of the situation. And even if it did only cost me 25 cents a cup, you're only selling them for 250, so how many cups of coffee do you realistically have to sell in order to stay in business and to grow your business? So if we look at the math, we're just gonna do some quick math here. $10 a pound for a, cup, for a pound of coffee for most specialty coffee roasters that they're buying wholesale. And I'm giving you just low numbers here. So if I do a two liter batch, I'm looking at 250 for a batch, I get five cups out of that. My cup of coffee is about 50 cents. You add in your couplet and sleeve and your condiments because rarely does cup of coffee go out looking like it does in this picture. It usually has some sort of additional color to it, putting you at about 75 cents, not dollars, for that cup of coffee. So your gross profit, you're selling it for 250, is about 175. Now, percentage-wise, those margins are not terrible, but again, how many cups of coffee do you have to sell to actually run a business and have run a successful business off of that? Now, let's look at adding a food offering, a substantial food offering, like we're seeing emerge more and more. How many of you guys had that avocado toast out there this morning? Yes, avocado toast, it is the new thing, and there's a reason for it. It's easy to do, and you have good margins off of it. Artisan bread costs you about 75 cents a slice. It's not cheap, but you know, 75 cents a slice. Um, avocados, you use half of avocado. We got slammed on Yelp, speaking of which, because our avocado toast had too much avocado. Recipe I've always done is half an avocado, but whatever, everybody's got their opinion of the perfect avocado toast. Hence, the additional dollar for stuff that I add. You can see in this picture, everybody has a different way of producing their avocado toast. Um, Total 275. Now, last year, um, an Australian millionaire, I forget his name, but he was doing a 60 Minutes interview, a real estate guy. And I'm sure you all heard it. He said, you know, if these kids these days want to buy a house, when I was trying to buy my first house, I wasn't spending $19 on avocado toast and $4 on coffee. And people were quite offended by that. And in case you're thinking I would never spend $19 on avocado toast, even if you're just spending the nine, which I'm sure many of you have, the margins still look much better for a coffee shop. You've got a gross profit of $7.15 on that avocado toast versus $1.75. So your ticket average increases, but your gross profit increases tremendously when you add in a substantial food offering. And I think that as you talk about the labor involved and how much more expensive labor is getting, when you're able to add in these substantial items that have a much higher gross profit, that's how you're going to look at really growing a business. I don't think it's gonna be possible to just do it based on coffee alone as we continue to grow. As we continue to urbanize, rents get higher, more expensive, and these are all things that as a business owner you have to kind of look at, and I think just selling coffee is gonna be a much harder proposition. The other nice thing about food menus is they're relatively easy to do. Now this is Go Get em Tiger. Um, Jeffrey had mentioned how you guys are gonna go there tomorrow, some of you. And in case you don't know about Go Get Em Tiger, they have five or seven locations now, and it's ran by two US barista champions or the founders of it, okay? These guys know coffee. Their brand is coffee. And yet if you look at their menu here, I apologize, it's very blurry on here, but if you look at their menu, this one little section here is coffee. The rest of it is food, because food is how they know how they're going to be a sustainable business, how they're going to drive revenue, how they're going to continue to grow the business. So if two US barista champions build a coffee house and a menu and they put a substantial emphasis on food, I think it's something that you're going to see more and more people continue to follow. And it's easy to do. I mean, if you go to one of their locations, it's two induction burners, a panini press, and a convection oven. And that's what everything runs off of. There's no back of house kitchen. So it's low startup, it's low investment, and yet it really helps contribute to the bottom line and the success of cafes. So I think you're going to see this food trend continue to be much more substantial. You're gonna see more people integrate it, getting away from pastries, following that more Australian model of having that brunch, those bowls, really easy items to go with it. All right, so the next 
trends that I see. So food is one. The next trend that I really see continuing to grow is mocktails. Uh, we talked about sparkling water. Obviously, yeah, sparkling water was mentioned as something that's continuing to grow. And for a cafe environment, I actually think mocktails are a really good potential for revenue growth and revenue stream as well. Now, alternative drinks are nothing new to coffee houses. Everybody's kind of seen some sort of alternative menu that people have on their board. But when it comes to mocktails, what it allows you to do is it does two things. One, it brings your customer who came in for their morning cup of coffee back in later for the day for something a little bit different. Two, it also brings in a totally different customer that may not have came and visited you. Um, I think Starbucks did a great job of keying in on the success of kind of alternatives with their purchase of Tivana. Now, while the Tivana stores were not necessarily successful, the introduction of the Tivana refreshers and sparklers in their stores has really been quite successful. There are quite a few people now who associate Starbucks with getting their iced tea, their sparkler, that segment of it. And I think you're going to continue to see that element really grow. Again, it brings in a different customer, and it gives an additional purchase to your current customers. We've already seen equipment manufacturers seeing the success in this. Bun has their refreshers, sparkling water on demand. And I think the idea behind it was originally, hey, coffee houses love to serve sparkling water with their espresso, so we'll put this in there. But coffee houses have just taken off with it with the offerings that they do now. And that's what you're starting to see with this continued line. Um, one of the other things, you know, if you think about it, you're in a cafe, you go there, you've got your handcrafted latte, right? It's beautiful, it's got some gorgeous art on it. You want something to kind of break it up. Maybe you want something light before you leave to take away with you. Going to a grab and go, purchasing a Coke is just not going to do it, right? Even a sparkling water, that's fine, but again, you're looking at a 250 transaction. Enter the mocktail, right? So you've got your latte there. Imagine after that, you want something a little bit lighter, and you get something like that presented to you as an option. And this is where I think you're really going to see growth in coffee houses is this mocktail segment. Um, have anybody heard of shrubs? I know a few of you guys probably have. So shrubs are another continuing um, trend as well. We see them in the bartending industry. Shrubs. <laughs> First time I heard it, I was like, really? People are drinking this? So it's drinking vinegar. It's a combination of vinegar, sugar, and then some sort of fruit, some sort of herb that you're adding to it. So one like this, you would do blueberries and lavenders. It's easy to make in a cafe. It's low cost, but it's handmade. It's artisan. It's to the same level that your coffee is. When you talk about wanting to do boutique, I think one of the challenges with espresso, as we've talked about labor, is espresso still is very labor intensive. Items like this, though, are not. They're low training, they're easy to execute, they're fast, but they still have a great $6 pickup on them. Versus if you just pour an iced tea, your margins are there, but again, your gross profit's not. So when you're looking at how do we become a successful cafe, we've been talking about the, um, the, the successful business model that you want to follow. It's items like this that are going to help to separate it out. So I think your mocktails are going to be more and more popular um, and a bigger part of the coffee offering menu as well. Now, I'm in Southern California, so we deal a lot, obviously, with these iced beverages, but we're also seeing mocktails in the form of lattes, but without espresso, more towards the health and wellness feeling, if you will. Golden lattes, so a latte, no espresso, but turmeric, honey, cinnamon, turmeric has tons of health benefits, so that's become very popular. Um, activated charcoal lattes are something that we've seen come out this past year as well. Um, I don't know if it's because of the Instagram or the health benefits, but the charcoal latte is definitely something that we saw come up this year. And then I have matcha up there because interestingly enough, matcha over the past five years has gone up 600%. Now it's still a very small pocket, but I've been in coffee for 25 years and there's been a matcha trade show, at, you know, a matcha booth at every trade show I've ever been to, but it's just now really kind of found its footing as people are starting to look for these health and wellness options. And I think what you're seeing when you look at a coffee house is a coffee house is a place where you get your pick-me-up, right? Whether that pick-me-up is caffeine, whether that pick-me-up is kind of an overall health and wellness, or whether that pick-me-up is for your soul. So I've got a girl who works for me, goes to coffee houses all the time, and it's what she does in her spare time. And her order is an espresso and a lemonade. Now, she gets the espresso because she's constantly trying to improve her palate. She wants to be better at coffee. She wants to know what people are doing with their coffee, what it's tasting like, ask questions to the barista. But she gets the lemonade because, honestly, she just wants to hang out with her friends and have a great time. And she just wants to sit back and relax. And lemonade's just one of her favorite beverages. So whatever their mocktail, whatever their alternative is, that's what she gets because that's what she enjoys. The espresso she gets because she wants to talk and learn, but it's the lemonade that she gets 
in order to kind of fulfill her soul, if you will. And I think that's where you're really going to start to see the cafe environment go. We talked a lot about that human interaction, and that, that conversation is not going to go away. Um, so we've talked about fills. How many of you guys have been to a fills? Okay, so about half the room. If you haven't, there's some local down here, so I highly recommend you go because they have a completely different concept if you go to Phil's, okay? So you walk in, and one of the things that they've really tried to do a good job on is with that human interaction. You're greeted right away. You walk up to somebody. It's not intimidating. You kind of may not know what you're doing. The bars are set up totally differently. Somebody will wave you over there. And what you're going to find most distinctly about Phil's when you walk in, there's lots of bright colors. It is not what you're typically used to seeing of these more boutique specialty coffee houses. It's not these clean, modern lines. They do a great job of embracing the local community. So if you go to their San Francisco location in the Mission District, super bright Latin colors, very reflective of the community. There's one right downtown here, and it's a little bit cleaner, a little bit more clean lines, but still has kind of a funky feel to it. And that's kind of what Phil's goes after. But what makes them more interesting than any of that is they have no espresso machine. All hand poured drip coffee. That's what Phil's is built upon. All hand poured drip coffee, zero espresso machine. They do have a food menu as well with their toast, but it's all about that hand poured drip coffee. Just like you see in that picture here, they pour it from plastic pictures, pitchers. I mean, it doesn't get less specialty than pouring hot water out of a plastic pitcher high up where your coffee's splashing around, but this is what they're building it off of. And the coffees that you see when you go to and you look at the menu, there's not even single origins on there. It's all blends. There's three different sections. You've got your light, your medium, your dark. You've got five blends under each of them. And you're just like, what is going on? But you go up, and it, especially coffee, you could say hit or miss, but it's definitely a coffee that is made specially for you. And you talk about that human interaction and what people are looking for and the trends that you're going to see in cafes, and this is what consumers are telling you that they want. Coffee houses did not come out of a need for coffee, but a need for community. Bars are where you go to forget about your problems. Coffee houses are where you go to talk about your problems, to solve your problems. And I think the Phil's model has done a really good job of embracing that. I love espresso, but I think you could easily make the argument that espresso has kind of ruined coffee in the sense that look at why we came out of espresso. The story I've always been told is the espresso machine came out of the fact that the workers were taking too long on their breaks. They wanted it to go faster. It's too much chit chat. I wanted to make a faster coffee so my employees could get to work quicker. And since then, we've just continued with that need for speed, right? Now we've got drive throughs we've got mobile ordering, and that need's not going to go away. We're always going to have that segment. But what it took away from us was kind of the heart of coffee. You know, the, what I love about Phil's is just how naked it is. It's simple. It's coffee, and it's water, and it's not a lot more than that. You talk about espresso, and we talk about where specialty coffee has gone, and things have gotten very fancy and very blingy with the machines and the latest and greatest. They've, you know, you've got your Instagram and your latte, and it became about that. But we lost a little bit of, but it's about the people. It's about the community. You talk about an Ethiopian coffee ceremony, and it's, you know, this beautiful transaction of the community coming together. You look at, you know, coffee from Arabia, and it's the same thing. You, anytime you look at a mocha pot, it's always got multiple glasses around it because you were always having it with a group of people, with a community of people. And I think that that's going to be the trend that we see coming out of coffee over the next few years, is we're going to go back to making the coffee house the community place, the meeting place where people go, where people talk. And it, I think you're going to have to have different offerings in order to bring your community to you. It's not going to be a menu anymore of five small items but it's going to be making sure that you've got something for all different times of day to satisfy the soul. And it does have to be something that you can also make money at and that you can be sustainable at. And I think it's going to be a combination of those two things that you're really going to see happen. Consumers not just want to know that they're taken care of, though. I mean, we've seen the C price of coffee fall below a dollar again this year, and that's a huge crisis for coffee. And consumers are more aware of that than they have been in the past. HuffPost just did an article on it. So it's getting out of the coffee community now and going to consumers. And coffee houses are going to have to respond to that. Companies are going to have to be held responsible for how they treat their customers, how they treat their, um, how they treat their vendors, and how they treat their community as a whole. 
Um, I think it sums up, I think Phil's actually sums it up very nicely. They say, bettering days through warmth and connection, one day at a time is their motto. And I think that that's what people are going for right now. I think that when people are, I think the ultimate trend in coffee right now is not going to be a next piece of equipment, it's not going to be one drink. I think it's going to come down to how are you able to create not the human connection just necessarily with you and the customer, but the connections that they are, the spaces that you create for them to be able to make those connections as well. Thank you.